All right, so my name's Doug Schiller. My name's Kevin Martin. Uh, we've also got to give credit for part of this present uh, for part of this presentation to uh, a colleague of ours that was not able to be here, David Nunyali. Uh We're going to be going over uh, thromboelastography, um, or uh, uh, TEG, as it is uh, sometimes called. Um, but more specifically, we're going to be going over the device we use at our facility here, um, which is the Rotem device. So. Essentially, the difference between these two devices is the part that spins. So the uh, TEG or the thromboelastography, uh, in that special device itself, the cuvette is what spins, uh, which is the cup where the blood is added to. With the Rotem device, it is the spindle that actually uh, is dipped down into the blood and then spins back and forth and oscillates back and forth. So what happens is once the blood is added into the cuvette, the spindle will oscillate back and forth, and as the clot begins to form within there, uh, that's what actually gives you your visual representation on the graph, which we'll see here in a little bit. And it, it essentially, uh, my understanding, is withdraws um, this spindle as it's spinning, and that's what gives us part of our graph. Is that correct? Yes. So as you can see in here, this is the visual representation of uh, the Rotem output. So the first thing that you look at is the clotting time. Now essentially what this is, is this is this green line here, um, and it goes out, and this is the time it takes for the blood in this cuvette to form to a clot of on the graph of 2 millimeters. So the next one is the clot formation time, and this is the time from the 2 millimeter point to the 20 millimeter point uh, of the clot formation. And this actually gives us our alpha angle, uh, which you can see in red. So what the alpha angle is, is that's actually uh, what we use to look at platelet function. And along with that fibrinogen to some degree. Um, so everybody remembers from you know clotting cascade clot formation, the first thing that starts to form is essentially some platelets binding together and aggregating. So we'll get back to more on that later on. And then the next thing that we look at is actually the maximum clot formation. And that is the, uh, the widest part of the graph that we see. And then another thing that we uh, take a close look at is maximum lysis. Um, so sometimes we'll have a clot that forms and then starts breaking down. And there's certain conditions that we have to be very concerned about then that in or medications that we give that can alter that as well. Um, another thing that's important just in how we look at this graph, uh, it's essentially an X and Y graph. Um, so the X axis here uh, going through the center is time. So over on the far left at where I drew this X is where we begin, that's time zero. And then as we progress, that's time progressing to where we start forming this clot. Um, the Y axis following upward and downward from the middle um, is the thickness of the clot that's developed at that point. Um, the critical point to remember is this 20 millimeter point um, that we use to calculate part of our alpha angle. So let's take a look at a couple examples. To explain the output a little bit more, we'll, we'll go over each one of these boxes. So in the upper left hand corner, we have our XTIM, and this looks at the external uh, clotting cascade, so mostly factor 7. Um, what this allows us to do is this actually allows us to look at uh, uh, if there's any effect from something uh, along the lines of Coumadin or liver dysfunction or something where there would be a deficiency of factor 7. The next one would be the intim, uh, which is in the upper right hand corner, uh, and this looks at the intrinsic pathway of uh, the clotting cascade. So if we had somebody on heparin, something like that, then I assume that we would expect derangement of this pathway more than we would the x -tim. Exactly. So in the lower left hand corner we've got our fib -tim. and what this is is this takes platelets out of the mix entirely and looks specifically at fibrinogen and how the fibrinogen is clotting together. Um, so this will actually give us a picture if the patient's fibrinogen deficient and needs any replacement of that. And then lastly, in the lower right-hand corner, we have our AP TIM. And what this allows us to do is it allows us to compare to see if there's any fibrinolysis going on. And so my understanding is that they add a specific protein 
um, that essentially blocks fibrinolysis. What, what's that protein called? Uh, it's apoproteinin is the name of the protein, and that's what they add to the, uh, the fourth cuvette there to uh, make that graph in the bottom right-hand corner. So here's an example of a patient who would be platelet deficient or have dysfunctional platelets. As you can see, we talked a little bit earlier about that alpha angle, um, and you can see just how long these graphs are stretched out and how, just how much that alpha angle is uh, uh, blunted. Um, so this is a patient that would have some type of platelet dysfunction or s just be flat out low on platelets. Mm -hmm. And then um, one of the ways that we use this to determine whether it's platelet dysfunction or fibrinogen that's causing the problem with the low alpha angle because either of those can cause it. Uh, we then take a look down at the FibTim, and you can see that this FibTim, even though it also has a blunted alpha angle at the start, does show a very nice uh, thick clot formation here. Yes. So the next one is almost kind of the exact opposite. The platelets here look okay because if you look at your NTIM, your XTIM, and your APTIM, they all look fine. But if you look at your fib tim in the lower left-hand corner, you'll see it's very sharp, needle or very uh, blunted, needle-like, uh, and very small. So this is a patient that would basically have some type of fibrinogen deficiency. And so, what are what are some ways that we can try to replete that fibrinogen deficiency? So. Giving the patient platelets uh, could be a way of uh, replacing their fibrinogen. It does have a small amount of fibrinogen in the platelets. FFP is another way. Or if they don't need that much volume, you can use cryoprecipitate. Now this here is an interesting graph which actually shows clot breakdown. So if you look at your XTIM and your NTIM, you'll see how in the previous graphs they were stretched all the way across that x-axis, whereas this one it's breaking down and coming back down to a point. So this would be an example of somebody who's gone through some type of fibrinolysis. Um, so what are, what's something that we give, at least remotely commonly in the ED, that could cause some of this? So a perfect example of this would be somebody who received TPA. Now, if you look at your XTIM, your NTIM, and even your FibTIM, you'll see how they go up and then come back down. We talked a little bit earlier about the protein uh, and the APTIM, which mm -hmm. is the apoproteinin. Apoproteinin, yep. Um, that we add that into there, and that stops fibrinolysis. Um, so once you stop the fibrinolysis, you'll see that the clot actually goes back to a normal uh, graph. Um, there are a few different medications that we can give to actually stop fibrinolysis. What can we give? Because I, I know in this we give the apoproteinin, but it, you know, we can't give that to a person. So what can we give somebody to try to alleviate this if it's causing a problem, if they're having a hemorrhage, something else we need to control? So the perfect example of this would be transaxminic acid, which uh, was shown to be beneficial in uh, one of the uh, more recent articles, the CRASH-2. Um, another one that you could actually give is epsilon aminocoproic acid. And then lastly here, you can look and see that most of the clot formation seems to be okay, but if you look at your NTIM, you'll see that the clot takes a significant longer amount of time before the clot actually forms. So in the intrinsic pathway, as we discussed previously, this is most likely some type of heparin effect. Now if you look in the lower right hand corner, you'll see that it's not the AP TIM anymore, it's actually the HEP TIM. And what this does is it actually adds a uh, heparinase to it that breaks down heparin, and once you break down the heparin, you'll see the return of your normal uh, um, curve. And there is a medication that we have fairly similar to HEPTIM, and so, that is... protamine. Exactly. So, um, basically this was just an overview of a device we're using to look at real-time uh, clotting within the body uh, compared to the previously used INR, PTT, uh, the, um, the laboratory tests that were initially looked at more for hemophilia as well as um, Coumadin and following chronic medications. Exactly. Um, so we, we got a lot of our sources um, from the Rotem website. Um, we've been using this a fair amount, uh, predominantly with our trauma service here at the hospital. Um, we have definitely gotten some interesting utility out of it. Um, so hopefully this was educational. If you guys have any questions, feel free to contact us. Um, thank you. Thanks.
That's good, guys. That's good.